everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am an optometrist and I work here at the New England College of Optometry, uh, which is where I am currently streaming live from this morning. Um, and I work with uh, the, from the New England College of Optometry uh, with all this international on their optometry programs. Um, today we're going to be talking about trial frame refraction. I am an Australian uh, optometrist and I was trained at the University of Melbourne where trial frame refraction was just as important as ferrocter refraction. Uh, so when I graduated I was expected to be as proficient and as efficient on both techniques. Um, when I graduated I joined a practice that only did trial frame refraction which in Australia is not uncommon. Um, and so today a lot of the tips and tricks that we go through um, will be thanks to a mentor and a great friend of mine, Ian Clemens, who was my uh, first mentor when I graduated. So let's get started. Okay, so we have a couple of objectives today. Um, we're not, we're gonna go through the steps of trial frame refraction, but there was a webinar um, a couple of weeks back um, from Diane Russo who went through uh, subjective refraction and went through more in a more thorough detail than what I'm going to um, on the steps of subjective refraction. So if you haven't watched that webinar, I strongly encourage you to go back and download or watch online um, her webinar also later um, in the week, so by the end of the week, we'll have a handbook up online in the library, in the Orvis library, uh, detailing the steps of refraction for both subjective refraction in a ferropter and in a trial frame. So you'll have those as a reference as well. Um, today we're going to go through why trial frame is different and um, how it changes and how you can adapt your refraction technique to achieve everything you want to that you would in a ferropter. Um, and then at the end we're just going to go through a few challenging patients and testing environments. We're not going to, we have a lot of questions, both Dr. Russo and myself had a lot of questions um, coming in based on specific patient refraction questions and and altering or adjusting a refraction for a prescription, I am not going to address that today. Um, my team here at the New England College of Optometry are working very hard to get those uh, type of resources to you. So keep a, a watch out on CyberSite. Um, we're hopefully going to have some, uh, some patient cases and, and help you with those um, refractive difficulties. But in the meantime, though, um, I do want to just direct you, if you are on CyberSite and you do have specific patient questions, I just want you to direct you either to the cases and so you can start a case, you can see they're circled in blue. If you want to ask a specific question with specific case details, if you want to ask one of our doctors here, or jump on our discussion board. We have two discussion boards that we're part of, uh, Refraction Glasses and Contact Lens Forum and the Smartphone Technology Forum. We've got doctors here who specialize in low vision, pediatrics, um, general refraction, contact lenses. So please jump on, we wanna hear from you. Um, if you've got any questions, if you just wanna get involved in the discussion, we'd really love to hear from you. I am going to briefly cover um, a few things today. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm going to cover a few things today. I'm going to cover um, low vision patients and refraction in a trial frame. Uh, the reason that um, I'm covering this is it can get a little bit different um, and a little bit tricky with your trial frame. And that's often the reason why people say, no, I don't want to trial frame refract. Those patients are difficult. Um, but I'm not going to go through the details of the techniques of uh, retino retinoscopy or examining a low vision patient. We do have really fantastic webinars um, online. So if you are interested in that, please go to those webinars, go to the library and check them out. If you're not yet part of our community, please join us. You can see on the CyberSite uh, website there, you can join us. If you are joining us, make sure you click um, I'm here to learn. And yes, I'd like to um, receive expert advice. That's how you get involved in the chat discussions and the telehealth platform. So please make sure you uh, click those two buttons. 
Okay, so to get us started, this is actually for me and for, we've got quite a few pe uh, people participating. We're up to 60 at the moment and we have 400 registered. So I just want to get an idea of who is out there and how many people are trial frame refracting. So our first question today is how many people are trial frame refract? A, I never trial frame refract. B, I trial frame refract but only low vision patients. That's very common here in the US. C, I sometimes trial frame refract, like if I have to. <laughs> and D, I only ever trial frame refract. I don't use the Phoropter at all. We'll see if anyone's out there, anyone's awake. Great. So that's really fantastic. We've got a lot of people out there who are trial frame refracting. That's really fantastic. Okay, our next question for today is how many people learned how to do a full trial frame refraction in their degree? Uh, so A was no, I was only ever taught for opto refraction and then when I got out I had to sort of make do and learn myself. Uh, B, I was taught only trial frame refraction, that's all the only type of refraction I was taught. C, I was trained about equally similar to myself in Phoropto and trial frame refraction. And D, I was only trained in trial frame refraction in the context of low vision patients. So again, here in the US, that's very common that we only teach trial frame refraction uh, for uh, dealing with low vision patients. Okay, nice, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, my last question is gonna be how many people refract in environments outside of their clinic? So A is I never, it's only outside of my clinic, it's only ever in the clinic, in the hospital um, or clinic that I'm working in. B, I sometimes go out and do school or community screenings, but I don't do full refractions, just screenings. And C, I visit remote towns or nursing homes, school halls, we set up and we do a big full eye exam and full refractions. Okay, very cool. Um, so thanks for indulging me in that. I just wanted to get some information about who, who I was talking to. Um, they're gonna be our last poll questions. We're gonna try something a little bit different uh, with CyberSight today. They're our last poll questions. Um, what I do want you to do though is use the Q&A button, which is just down on the bottom um, of your screen there, um, or it might be sort of up on the, on the top corner. If you have a question, please type it in as we're talking. Um, I want questions like, uh, I don't understand what you just said. I don't understand that exact technique. Could you go over that this exact step again? Um, those kind of questions. Uh, questions that are more specific about patients or about patient care, um, then pop those on CyberSight. We, we are always there, we're available on CyberSight. We wanna hear from you. Um, so pop those on, up on our discussion boards. Uh, if it's something that I think we're gonna address later, then I'll just, I, I'm not ignoring your question. We'll just keep moving on. So please, um, type in questions as we're, as we're going along. So how is trial frame refraction different to a, refro a phoropter refraction? Uh, don't get me wrong, I love the phoropter and so I'm um, by no means uh, dissing the phoropter. Um, it is very efficient um, and I would say that a lot of people um, would say that they're more efficient on the phoropter and that's fantastic. It gives you a uh, a broader scope of tests um, and lenses that are readily available and so it can be a little bit easier to perform some tests. However, um, there are a few times where it's just not practical in young children. For example, they like to see um, who they're talking to, see your facial expression. It can also be quite scary behind the phoropter and sometimes they can be a little bit too short and you can't quite get the phoropter down. Um, also, in um, the elderly, uh, sometimes, uh, especially if they're hard of hearing, uh, then they like to look at you when they're talking and a trial frame really allows for that. It also means you don't have to watch to see if someone's uh, going back and pushing off the phoropter um, and so their, your vertex distance is changing. It's also really useful for patients with disabilities. Um, so if you have a mental disability, then uh, they can, uh, the patient can uh, communicate with you and can see your facial expression. 
Um, and if you have, if your patient has a physical disability, then uh, you don't have to get the phoropter down as far. You can also, if they're in a wheelchair and you can't get them up on your chair, then a trial frame is, is really perfect for those kinds of uh, patients. Um, also, another really good uh, set of patients is uh, patients with low vision. Uh, because again, you can see what's going on, they can see what's going on. People who speak a different language to yourself, and so a lot of miming is going on during your refraction. And people who have high prescriptions as well. So trial frame refraction is really great for that because you can um, control the vertex distance and make it very similar to the vertex distance that you're going to uh, prescribe um, with their eyeglasses. The best thing I love about trial frame refraction is everyone can do a trial frame refraction. Every patient suits a trial frame refraction, but there are some patients that the phoropter doesn't. So it just saves me from thinking, oh, should I or shouldn't I do trial frame this time? Okay, so we're gonna go through the equipment that we need for a trial frame refraction. First off, the trial frame itself, you can see there's lots of different types, but they all have a few things in common. The first thing is at the front here, they have a well where you can put your lenses in. And so there's usually three or four spots where you can pop the lenses in. You can also see they all, they all have numbers around the edge which tell you where your uh, cylinder axis is so you can line your cylinder lens. And they've got a little knob on the side that rotates the barrel um, of those three lenses. So you can uh, rotate the lenses uh, to match the axis that you, that you uh, wish to move it to. They also have a uh, well, some of them, a lot of them have a back lens well, either one or two spots at the back. This is really handy to put your sphere in the back and it's also uh, very helpful if you have a high prescription because that again lowers that vertex distance. You've got uh, a lot of them have adjustable temples and so you can adjust the uh, temple for the side of the uh, patient so it's nice and snug behind their ear. A lot of them have an adjustable nose bridge so you can see here the knobs at the top on this one here and it adjusts it up and down. Some of them have adjustable um, PDs or pupillary uh, distances. So you can adjust it on a monocular scale. The lens set itself, I've got a lens set behind me here that we're gonna be using today. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes. You can see some of the lenses have uh, metal rims and some of them have um, plastic rims. They're all the same. You're gonna see lots of them today. Lots of different types today. Okay, so our first set of equipment that I'm going to um, point out is your JCC lens. We're going to be using this a lot today. Um, it's something that uh, people have a little bit of trouble with, so we're going to go through the, the JCC lens. Sometimes, uh, often they can be purchased with the lens set, but often they're purchased by themselves in a, in a little container such as this. So you may have to purchase your JCC lens separately. You'll also see in your kit, you'll have a red filter and a green filter. These are your red and green filter lenses here. You'll have an occluder in your kit. It'll be somewhere in this part, in this part here. Um, that occluder just means that you can keep the prescription in the eye that you're not testing and you can just pop in that occluder and you can block off that vision so you're testing one um, eye at a time. We have a, a stenoic uh, Slit, I'm sure that I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. This is a very old um, way of testing for astigmatism, but we are gonna go through it today because it can be handy at some times. It's not as accurate though as JCC or Jackson Cross though. You have a pinhole um, occluder in your set as well. So the pinhole is really, um, really useful to, if you wanna know if your low visual acuity is due to refractive error or if it's due to pathology. So it works similar like a pinhole camera. When you put it in front and the patient looks through that tiny hole, it eliminates um, the refractive uh, error um, it, and it focuses the light um, at, the, at the retina. Hopefully, um, you get close to 2020 vision then and then you know, okay, it's refractive. I didn't get my refraction right. So it's a good way if you're not getting the visual acuity that you think that you should be getting, pop that pinhole in and see, is it you and your refraction method 
or is it actually pathology? Because if you put that in and it doesn't change, they're still getting pretty poor vision, then you know there's some pathology behind there. Maybe some cataracts, maybe some macular degeneration, optic nerve issues, things like that. You have a Maddox rod in your, in your set. Um, oh, this is a red one. You'll also uh, sometimes have a green and a clear one. They all do the same thing. Uh, we're not going to go through how we use the Maddox rod today. Uh, Dr. Geyser in June, she's got two webinars coming up and she's going to go through uh, binocular vision techniques. So it's good to know that you have your Maddox rod because she will use this a lot in her lecture. You also have some prisms. Again, we are not going to answer any questions or go through um, any uh, any patient cases with prisms. Dr. Geyser will be using prisms in her lecture, so it's good to know where your prisms live. Just on a side note for her lecture a little bit later, um, you can get loose prisms as well if you want to um, if you want to work with your trial frame, but you want to do some of the tests that she's talking about, particularly Riesley prisms, uh, she'll go through the use of Riesley prisms. You can get um, you can get little ones that sit into the trial frame, and you can do those Riesley prism tests. You can also get handheld ones, so that can be really helpful. So that's just a side note for when you watch her lectures in June. So on um, the left hand side here, you have your uh, negative lenses, if they're plastic, then they'll be in red, um, and always in red, negative is always red, and, and positive is usually black or white um, in optometry. And so you have your negative lenses, you have two sets of lenses, they're identical, they go from about uh, 0.25 to up to 14 diopters, and they go in various steps, sometimes 025 steps, sometimes 050, it depends on the, on the set. Over on the right hand side, you have your um, positive lenses. Again, you have two wells of identical sets of lenses. And up the top here, you have your uh, cylinder lenses. You can see that actually um, my cylinder lenses on the right hand side, I'm not quite sure if you can see that, it's empty. Um, in optometry, we use a negative sill, we work in negative sill prescriptions and refractions. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, so I've removed those lenses from my lens um, kit because it's annoying to have them there sometimes. I grab the wrong lens by accident. Um, but if you work in positive sill, the uh, theory is just the same. It's just that you're working in positive um, sill instead. So how do I work with a loose lens set? And there's a few tips and tricks to make it more efficient. First off, keep it tiny. The worst thing you can do is have a bunch of lenses in this middle well here. That is the worst thing you can do. It is so incredibly tempting as well, but you really do need to keep it tidy. Um, when I was at school, if I got caught with multiple lenses in this center part here, I believe that I, I lost some points from my patient and fair enough as well. The problem with having so many lenses here, it takes you time to put them back into your lens set and there's just not time in your day that you have if you're in a busy clinic, even if you're not in a busy clinic, it's just not time that you have. Um, you also, from patient to patient, you want to be very confident that you're pulling the right uh, lens out and so you, and you don't want to be searching through this center um, case during a refraction it really slows your refraction down the second thing is keep your fingers off the lenses when you're pulling them out use the little handle that's supplied you don't want to be grabbing the lens from the um, from the center lens you don't want to be cleaning it all the time every time you clean it uh, you waste a couple of seconds and that's not a couple of seconds you have in clinic you're saying, yeah, but what if I want to reserve a lens? What if I'm using a lens and I think, oh, maybe I'm doing retinoscopy and I think I'm going to come back to that. And that's a fair point. I completely understand your concern. But rather than be tempted to put the lens in this well, I still want you to put the lens back. But when you put the lens back, just flip it into the center. If you flip it into the center, then if you want to come back to it a little bit later, you don't have to search through that, that middle section looking for it. So you don't have to waste your time doing that. You can just run your, your finger down the center and grab the lens um, that you've reserved or that you've flipped into the middle. This way, if you don't end up coming back to it, then that lens stays in its spot and you don't have to clean up at the end of your refraction. 
Also, if you uh, do end up coming back to it, it's easy just to grab and, and you know which one that you've reserved. So don't be tempted to put it in the middle. Also, when you're working with a lens set, it's really helpful if when you're taking lenses that you take lenses that are in the right hand side of a well, just say we're looking at positive lenses here, if we take those lenses and put them in the patient's left eye, so your right side, and take lenses from the left side and put them in the patient's right eye or the, on, your left, on your left side. It just means two things actually. It means that when you're um, putting lenses back and you're in the middle of a refraction, you don't have to go back and see ooh, where exactly did that come from. Also, when you finish your refraction, it's really easy just to pop them back because you know that anything from this eye came from this side. So you just find the gap um, in your lens set and you know that's exactly where it lives. Use the gaps um, as a reference um, to put them away. So if you have a full lens set, make sure you've always got a full lens set. If you're missing a couple of lenses, they're actually really easy to order um, with the company that your lens set is from. You can order just an, a plus two if you're missing a plus two. But when you have your lens, I don't have to look very carefully at where I'm putting the lens back. I can just run my hands down, I find the gap, and I can pop the, the lens in that gap. So I don't have to really think about it too much. It's also really helpful when you're doing retinoscopy, which we'll go through in a second. Okay, so let's go through these steps of trial frame refraction. The first thing, just quickly, you do want to test you, your patient's vision with their current glasses on or if they have no glasses, just as they are. You want to do this with the full chart and you want to test both eyes individually and binocularly. We're going to do this for a few reasons. The first reason is for legal reasons. You don't want people coming back and saying, you ruined my eyes, you made them worse. So you've documented before you even started what their vision was. The second reason, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, the second reason is, is it gives you an idea of what their best visual acuity may be. If they're reading 2020 in their current pair of glasses and you're doing a refraction, you can't get them below 2030 then you know that something's not quite right because you, you know your refraction must be incorrect because in their glasses they were seeing quite clearly. Also, it gives you an idea about their management. If they're seeing 2020, that's great. Then you probably, you might tweak their glasses, you may not. Uh, if they're seeing 2040 in their glasses, then I'm thinking, okay, I do need to um, prescribe them glasses at the end of this. So it just gives you an idea about how you're going to proceed with management before you even start. Um, when patients are reading the chart, interestingly enough, they read just above their best corrected visual acuity. Um, I think most times people just don't want to make a mistake, which is fine, it's fair enough. So you just need to keep pushing them. So if they read the 2020 line, say, look, that's great. Can you read any of the letters on the next line below? They might be, they might be able to say, oh yeah, I see a C, E, and a K, and then something, something. So then you know they're 2020 plus two or plus three, depending on if they got those letters correct. Um, so reassure them, it's okay if you're wrong um, and if you get anything incorrect, but just keep trying for me. So how are we going to set it up? First of all, we want the patient sitting comfortably and we don't want them leaning forward. So that's one thing that a phoropter does stop the patient from doing is leaning forward. Um, so particularly kids, they tend to shuffle up in their, sh in their seat. Um, and so you don't want people leaning forward trying to get a better visual acuity for you. People always want to try and do the best by you. Um, so you keep reminding people to sit back nice and comfortable. Your illumination depends on your chart. If you're not using an electronic chart, um, then you need good bright illumination throughout your room. If you're using an electronic chart, particularly some of the charts that are a little bit older, you might have to dim the lights to get that contrast. And you wanna be off to the side of the patient. You wanna be able to manipulate your lenses, but you want the patient to be able to see straight through um, above your arm to the um, chart that's behind you. 
Just on a side note, um, when someone is uh, talking about leaning forward and squinting, um, when someone is reading visual acuity, it's always really important to keep watching the patient rather than watching the chart. You want to know your chart off by heart because if the patient is leaning forward and squinting and you're looking in the opposite direction and they're reading 2020 and you turn back around, you go, that's great. That's fantastic. They're not actually reading 2020. Um, they're squinting to make that happen. So you need to be watching your patient to make sure that they're not cheating or trying to do um, a little bit better by leaning forward or squinting. So know your chart off by heart. Okay, you also want to make sure that the trial frame is adjusted. So you want to make sure that your temple is straight. You want to make sure that it's not bent. You can see that the um, tilt on the left-hand side um, is changing the tilt of the, um, of the trial frame. And it's also probably going to make it a little bit crooked as well. And you want to make sure that it's nice and snug behind the ears. When I'm putting my trial frame on, I always tell my students, particularly if someone has long hair or if you're worried about catching their hair, to find the patient's ears just with the top of your fingers here, find their ears and then help them put the trial frame over the top and then um, shorten the temple so it fits up against their nose. You wanna make sure your frame is straight. And we had a question, um, in the pre in the pre questions that came through why is this important and it's a good question but it's really important if you end up prescribing a cylinder or astigmatism that is just say minus two and the frame is like this when you prescribe that it's the you're going to get the axis wrong so then when you prescribe it and you put it into your system and they get their glasses they're going to put their eyeglasses on and say i can't see anything you're gonna say, oh, but that's really odd. The prescription in the glasses matches the prescription in my computer or on your file. Um, but what you haven't taken into account is that your trial frame was very, very crooked. So you wanna make sure that your trial frame is straight. And also a lot of people have a lot of facial asymmetry. So you wanna make sure that trial frame is not only straight, but it's straight with the eyes and where the, um, your eyeglasses are gonna sit. So have a look if you're, maybe if your eyes are a little bit, maybe one's higher than the other, you just wanna be mindful of that. You wanna make sure that the pupil uh, distance matches the patient's um, pupillary distance. So you can see in the middle there that it's way larger for her face. So we need to bring that in. Um, and you also wanna make sure that the nose rest is right up on the top of the nose. Some of these can be really uncomfortable. Um, if you have a trial frame that patients complain a lot about, um, sometimes putting a little bit of a tissue here or cotton wool is helpful just to relieve the pain or the red mark from the patient's uh, nose after you've finished refracting. They might complain a little less with some cotton wool. And make sure that the patient again is looking through the center of the lens. Okay, so we, we are coming up to a, a set of questions. I can see I've got a few questions coming in, which is great. So if you've got any questions so far, if you're thinking this lady is crazy, I don't know what she is talking about, please let me know and we can go over um, some things together. So where do we start? We have three options. And to be honest, I don't mind which option you go for. You have retinoscopy, uh, where you objectively uh, see what the prescription is. You have an autorefractor. A lot of clinics autorefract their patients before they even get into your, into your rooms, which is fine. Keep in mind that accommodation affects this a lot, affects the autorefractor a lot. Um, it assumes that you have a normal lens and a normal corneal shape. So if you have someone with keratoconus or cataract, your autorefractor result isn't gonna be correct. It's not as accurate for higher prescriptions. Um, and the patient must always have their forehead. So if you, uh, if a tech um, or another clinician is doing the autorefraction for you, you just wanna make sure that they know that the patient's um, forehead has to be up against the rest. Or you, if you know what their previous uh, glasses prescription is, you could just start from that point, if, especially if they're seeing quite well and you're just gonna slightly adapt it. Uh, 
so refraction, uh, sorry, retinoscopy with loose lenses. You could use retinoscopy racks. That is absolutely fine. Um, but you can do retinoscopy with a trial frame. It's very easy, but you do have to stick to a couple of rules. The first rule is go in one diopter steps. You want to touch the least amount of lenses possible. Yeah, you don't want to be going in tiny 025 or 050 steps. I like one diopter because it's easy to count. <laughs> if I go in 075 steps, I sort of lose count after a while. But one, two, three, four, I've got that down pat. So uh, another thing is it's easier to uh, do your retinoscopy and neutralize both meridians with uh, spherical lenses. And the reason is particularly if you're doing it in dim lighting, with these lenses here, you have to like sort of squint, sort of like line it up and it takes a little bit of, uh, a little bit of time to do that. So it's better to neutralize each meridian and then at the end, taking this um, sill lens here and putting that in instead of your most uh, negative um, prescription. So I'm going to give you an example here. I'm going to give you an example here. If we're doing retinoscopy and just say we're, uh, we're doing retinoscopy and I'm seeing a with motion first, I'm going to scan all the way around each meridian and I think, oh yeah, I'm scanning up and down like this and I see a with motion. So if I see a with motion, I'm going to grab that one diopter lens and I'm going to hold that over over the eye. Again, still a with motion. So I'm not going to try not to be tempted. And because my lens set is a full set, I know exactly where this lens uh, belongs. And I count my lenses using my fingers. So I go one, two, three, and I grab the fourth one. I know that's going to be my plus two. So I don't have to be looking at my, um, at the numbers on my lens set. So again, and I think, oh, you know what? I think it's still with, but it's close. This is when it's really tempting to go in small steps, but don't do it. So one, two, three, four. I'm gonna hold my plus three lens over the top. I'm ready now and I think, okay, great, it's against. This is really great. It's really easy, especially if you're a, a, one of my students because they need to be within 075 to pass their retinoscopy. You're within 075. You know it's not plus two, so it's plus 225, 250, 275, and at three it reverses. So you already know it's one of those three numbers. Then I'm going to count down two and I'm going to grab the 250 and this lens is going to tell me the answer. Either it's going to be neutral, a little bit against or a little bit with and I can spend the time going nice and slow and watching that, um, watching that reflex nice and slow. Uh, then once I'm happy with that, I'm going to leave that in the trial frame and I'm going to go to my other meridian. So I'm going to go across to my other meridian. And now I'm scoping in this direction and I think, okay, great. It's a little against. So I'm going to pop in a minus one. It's really tempting. I know when it's just a little against to go in small steps, but don't do it. it, it trust me, this saves so much more, time, so much time for you. So you know, I'm going to just hold over this over the um, trial frame. I'm going to scope across. It's width now. So it reversed, which I was sort of expecting because I only saw a little bit of motion. And I'm going to grab my O50 lens here and I'm going to scope again, this minus O50 lens is going to tell me the answer. Either it's neutral, it's a little bit against, or it's a little bit with. So I see this and I think, oh great, it's neutral. Rather than popping this minus O50 lens, I'm going to now come up here and I'm going to grab a minus O50 cylinder lens. And then I can spend a little bit more time lining it up with the meridian that I saw the most negative, that I neutralized um, with the most negative power. Okay, so that's how we do retinoscopy. That's a, pretty much as much as I'm going to um, talk on retinoscopy. If you have some questions regarding retinoscopy, please post them up online or also go back. I really encourage you to watch Dr. Bastian's le lecture on retinoscopy. It's really quite a fantastic lecture.
We get this question a lot, do you cycloplege every patient or not? Um, when do I cycloplege? Actually, our um, a colleague from Cameroon um, sent this through, which I love because we have this, uh, we had this disagreement when I was in Cameroon last, this discussion about whether or not to cycloplege. A lot of people do it in a lot of different ways. Obviously, we want to relax the accommodation as much as we possibly can so we get an accurate distance refraction. But that doesn't mean that you always need a cycloplege. I don't cycloplege if the patient's age suggests that their accommodation isn't super active. So if someone is in their 30s or 40s, particularly if they're presbyopic, obviously their accommodation system is not very active at all, um, then I don't cycloplege those patients. Um, if someone is young and in their 20s, they can take directions. <clears throat> so when I get them to look at a distance target to relax their accommodation, they're gonna take those directions and they're gonna do what they're told. So I'm less concerned about um, cycloplegying those patients, even though their, their accommodation may be quite active still. I don't cycloplege if I can't check for angles. Um, so if I'm in an area um, where I'm just using a pen light to see if the angles are open or closed, then um, I won't, if I'm a little bit concerned about what I'm seeing, then I'll send them into my clinic so we can cycloplege them there after I've checked their angles. Um, I also don't cycloplege if I need to refract without, uh, without suspended accommodation. So often in patients, they don't accept full cycloplegic refraction well. Um, a good example of that is my husband. I prescribed his first set of glasses and he hated me for a very long time um, for prescribing his full, um, his full prescription. It's okay to do a little bit of work. It's okay for accommodation to be doing a little bit of work. Not everyone needs to be fully relaxed. If people are having trouble, you might give them maybe half of their prescription just to support the accommodative system, but you don't need to fully relax the accommodation system in every patient. Obviously, if the patient has strabismus or amblyopia, then that is a completely different story. You want to throw that full refraction, that full cycloplegic refraction at that, at that kid. You absolutely want them to have their full cycloplegic refraction. But if the person is now 30 and they're amblyopic, well, I'm just going to prescribe the, pres the refraction that makes them feel most comfortable because it's not going to change their state of amblyopia in any way. Also, I'm not going to do a cycloplegic refraction if I want to do binocular testing afterwards. There's nothing worse than a student coming in and says, I've dilated this patient and I think it's a binocular issue. And you're thinking, oh, this, they have to come back because I can't do any of the binocular testing if accommodation is suspended. So that's another reason why I don't cycloplege every patient. Obviously, uh, if we want to check for ocular health um, and you want to dilate, that's a completely different story. You might do that at the end of your exam. There are other ways to minimize um, accommodation. We'll be talking about fogging, and I know that Dr. Russo talked about fogging as well. Um, fogging refers to you putting plus in front of the eye to fully relax accommodation to the point where everything is blurry. Then you slowly decrease the, the plus in front of the eye to the point where they can see their best visual acuity at the maximum plus. So if, you're, if you've popped in a plus one, you keep decreasing it. When they see their best visual acuity, you're not going to continue to decrease it because you know that their accommodation is fully relaxed at that point. So uh, we will go over that a little bit in uh, today's in the next half hour or so. Um, but if you want to go through that in more detail, please watch Dr. Russo's uh, lecture. We binocular balance patients to make sure that a combination of one eye isn't a little bit more stimulated um, than the other. And you're going to binocular patients who have active accommodation and have fairly equal vision between the eyes. Um, if a patient is 50, Obviously, they're presbyopic and they don't have any active accommodation, so you don't really need to, to worry about that. You can also use your durochrome test, which we'll go through in a second. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly have a look at our Q&As here and see if there's anything... Okay, fantastic. I think we've answered all the questions um, and regarding the red... 
we're and green chart we're about to do that. Um, so we want to occlude the left eye because it's a good habit to get into to refract the right eye um, first. And you want to measure best visual acuity with your starting point. So if that's refraction uh, that they already have, you obviously don't need to do that again. You did that with their glasses on. But if you did a retinoscopy, then just check where their vision is with your retinoscopy. You can see in this picture here, her sphere lens is in the well at the back of the trial frame and her um, cylinder lens is in the front of the trial frame, um, which is handy. It means you don't have to keep changing that sphere lens. You can make minor adjustments and at the end alter that sphere lens. Um, but it also means uh, that if it's a high prescription, then it's closer to the eye. You don't have to worry about vertex distance, which we'll, we'll cover um, just very briefly uh, later. So you want to show the full chart. You want to make sure that, they're, that you're pushing them down to their best visual acuity. So you, um, often my um, students, they panic um, when they don't, they do the retinoscopy and they're starting visual acuity is bad. Maybe they're seeing like 20, 30 um, and they're thinking, oh my gosh, that's terrible. That's not what I want. Um, they were seeing much better in their glasses. Don't panic. First of all, not everyone sees to 2020 and that's okay. Not everyone can get 2020 vision and that's all right. Some of us have bigger noses than others. Some of us have sharper eyes than others. And that's just life. And sometimes there'll be cataracts and things that you can't change. And again, that's just fine for the time being. Also, trust your retinoscopy. Don't go back and look at it again. Don't waste your time. We know from Edgar's chart that if you're seeing like 20, 30, you may only be like maybe 050 diopters away from the actual prescription. So don't panic. Just keep going forward. You want to refine the sphere. And you can see on the bottom left-hand side there, you want to refine the sphere. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to point to the, to the uh, line that they were reading best. And I'm going to say to them, I'm going to show you two lenses. And I want you to tell me which of these lenses makes the, your vision clearer. So this is lens one. And this is lens two. I'm always going to start with my O25. So I have a plus O25 and a minus O25. And I'm saying this is one, this is two. This is one, this is two. If they say they like um, one, so that's your plus lens, then grab your plus O25 from the other side. Sometimes I know I said not to do that. Sometimes it's okay to Rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, so pop that in their trial frame and do it again. Is it better one or is it better two? Keep popping, keep putting in that plus O25 um, until they say it's the same or they say now number two is better. So now the negative lens is better. So you know you've gone a little bit too far. You over plus them just a tiny bit there. If they really like the negative lens, then I'm going to ask them uh, to read a little bit further. So just say they were reading uh, the 2020 line and I say better one or two and they, and they say, oh, two, the negative lens is, is better. And that, oh, two is better. Then I'm going to say, oh, great. Can you read, whilst I'm holding it, can you read any more letters on the line below or any more letters on that line that you read out earlier? If they say, oh, not really, it's just clearer then we know as the clinician that that's just the effect of a negative lens. It makes things crisper and darker and smaller. So we're not going to give that negative lens. If they say, yeah, I can see N, C, V, D, Z now. Great. Give them that extra um, minus. You have, you've under minus them. Um, but if they can't read any further, then bad luck. They just prefer that lens because it's a negative lens. Then we're going to do durochrome test, and we're, I'm not too worried about the fact that that um, refining of, of uh, sphere isn't really very accurate. I'm not too concerned about that because I'm going to do durochrome test. I'm not going to go through this test in a, in a lot of detail um, because Dr. Uh, Russo did go through this test in a lot of detail, but I do want to just say, and this actually comes from um, my colleagues in Cameroon, a spectacular little trick that they do. If you don't have a computerized chart and you don't have a red green chart, one thing you can do is use your red green lenses that are in your lens set. 
So we have a patient here and we're going to say, is it better? Is, is it better with the green or the red? This is the green. This is the red. And they say, yeah, it's really, it's much sharper with the red. So then we're going to add that sphere. We're going to add that plus 025 sphere to the, um, to the patient's uh, trial frame, just in the front of the trial frame, that right eye. Then we say, okay, now this is the red, this is the green, this is the red, this is the green. And they say, the green is clearer now. We get this question a lot. How do I choose? If they say red one and they add in plus 025, now they see the green, which one do I choose? Ideally, they would say they're equal, but it's okay to leave the patient one step on the green. When we do JCC, it's actually a little bit easier for the patient to do the test if we leave them one step on the green. Ideally, though, you'd be like, this is red, this is green, and they say they look exactly the same. So then you know that you're at that perfect prescription and you're going to leave the power. Okay, so any questions before we move on? Which is better to show the patient, a line of letters or a single letter? I think it depends on uh, the chart that you have. So if you have an electronic chart where you can actually minimize the letters, it's likely that you have duochrome in there. So have a play around with your, um, with your controller because you will most likely have duochrome. If you don't have a chart that can isolate the letters, then in that case, you're going to just use the whole chart and you're going to direct them down to their best visual acuity if you're just, good, if you're just doing the, the single lenses there. Okay, we had a few other questions there, but we're going to cover that in a moment. Okay, so now we're on to the astigmatism. This is the fun part. This is when we get to see the JCC. Okay, so you want to isolate one line if you can, and you, you want that line to be one step above their best visual acuity. Or if you can't, just, get the, just point to that line and show them the line you want them to look at. Again, I'm not going to go over in great detail how um, cross-cylinder works. Please uh, have a listen to Dr. Russo's lecture. She goes over it in far greater detail. What I do want to do is just show you how the JCC lens works. So we're going to refine axis, and Dr. Russo goes through this, but if, you, if your uh, retinoscopy had a cell greater than 050 cell, then you're going to refine your axis first. So you're going to align the handle of the JCC with the, um, with the cylinder lens. So you can see here, down here, I've, this is the handle. This is where the cylinder, these are where the markings are on the cylinder lens. So if we go back, that's where the markings are. And I'm going to align, align the handle. So the dots, the red and white dots are either side. You can see here in real life, you can't actually see exactly where the lines are just because it's a, a live photo. You can't see where the lines are, but you can, um, but trust me, it's either side of that, of that cylinder there. So you're going to align your handle with the lines. So you can see here, I've got a minus 125 cell in there. I'm going to align the handle and I'm going to flip and I'm going to say, which is clearer? I'm going to show you two lenses and I want you to tell me which lens makes that line clearer and sharper. This is lens one, this is lens two. Sometimes I'll, I'll say, I'll show you again. This is one, this is two. Um, it's best to advise the patient that neither lens will be completely clear, but just ask which is best. Sometimes they'll say, oh, they're both really bad. Um, so it just saves you some instructions later on. And you just want to flip your lens just, and see if we can get this, just like this, just twisting your handle. Um, you're going to, uh, I'm not going to go through this just for the sake of time. Dr. Russo went through this um, in very clear detail about which axis to follow, but you're going to, if they prefer the, um, minus access or the red dots, you're going to move in, in that direction until they say they look about the same. Then with power refinement, you want to line the, uh, the dots that you have here. You want to, sorry, the lines in the, on my JCC on this one. You want to align those um, with the power 
of the of the lens so with the axis of the lens so again you can see that's your cylinder axis there and then i'm going to place that lens so the so in this case this jcc has dots you can see in the live picture this jcc has lines um, you want to align those with the uh, cylinder axis so this is again our our example before and you're going to ask the patient which is best this is one this is two this is one this is two uh, if they say the red dots are a little bit clearer you're going to add cylinder power so that's more minus power to that meridian if they say the white dots are clearer you're going to add more are you going to take away that cylinder power so you're going to take away minus power from that meridian if the once the um, two, once they say they look about the same, then you know that you're finished. Again, I'm not going to go through this in, in a lot of detail. Dr. Russo did in her um, webinar, but you want to make sure you maintain spherical equivalent the entire time. So if you increase your um, cell, then you want to make sure that you're increasing your sphere as well. What happens if they say, if, if you do your retinoscopy and you don't have any cylinder to go off, if you think, oh, I didn't see any astigmatism, it looked pretty spherical to me. What do you do? So this is what you do. So this is just their sphere lens and I'm gonna ask them, which is clearer? This is one, oh, sorry, this is one, this is two. And you see that I've just flipped my lens from side to side and I've essentially given them two options. Is it clearer at 45, where that red is at 45 or the red is at 35? So they say, Option two, okay, great. Then I remember that they prefer that axis at 135. Now I'm gonna show them, I'm gonna orientate my JCC. So it's a light, so the power lines or the power dots are now at 90 and 180. And I'm gonna say now, how about here? Is it clearer with lens three or lens four? This is three, this is four. And they say option three. So I think, okay, great. What I know, is if they do have any astigmatism, it's somewhere between 135 and 180 degrees. So I take my O50 lens from here and I put it at about, I don't know, like somewhere in between, maybe 160 degrees. I put it at 160 degrees and I show them again with the, my power dots, is a better one, one or two? If they say two, then I'm gonna go and do the whole JC C procedure, the whole cross cylinder procedure, because there's obviously something there. If they say one though, which is the white dots, and I'm just going to take that O50 out and call it a sphere, say they have a spherical prescription. I could lower it down O025 um, if I'm really convinced there was something there. Um, I could do that, but they're likely just to, to say that they prefer the white light, the white dots or the white lines there as well. Okay, I know JCC can be a little bit confusing. Any questions? In a child, how is this possible? It's not really, it's not possible. I'm gonna go through that in a, in a second. If we have two different axes on autorefraction, uh, which one do you choose? Just choose one of them. Yeah, just choose one of them and go from there. Uh, your JCC will just keep correcting you and pushing you in the right direction of your of the meridian. So just choose one of them. It doesn't make any difference where your starting point is. It might mean if you choose the wrong one that your visual acuity is a little bit is a little bit off, and that's fine. That's fine. That will all work out in the wash once you've done your your JCC test. Okay, now we're going to get to that fogging aspect that we were talking about before. Um, you're going to pop plus one. So remember this left eye is still occluded. You're going to pop that plus one. You're going to warn the patient that it'll be blurry. Otherwise, they'll think you're an idiot. You have no idea what you're talking about. If you just say, what do you see now? They're going to say, uh, nothing, it's blurry. So tell them this is going to be a little bit blurry. What's the best vision you can see? Maybe they're reading the 2040 line. So what I do is so they've got that, that plus one lens in there. In that, in that eye, then I pop in the 075 and then I take this one out. And the reason I want to do that is I want to keep them, oops, I want to keep them fogged the whole time. So then I say, okay, where can you read to now? So now they say, oh, they can read a little bit further along, maybe two lines, maybe just one. And I'm going to pop this one in here 
and take this one out. Now where do you see to? And they might be able to read right down to the bottom of the chart. Um, if they're reading 2020, I will then, and I just say they're at 050, I will pop in the 025, take the 050 and say, can you read any um, more letters below that? Or can you see that line, read that line any easier? If they can, then I'll, I'll give them that lens. If they can't though, then they get the lens from before. So you want to make sure that the visual acuity is actually improving. Then you're going to occlude the right eye and you're going to do the whole process again. We're going to quickly go through binocular balance. It's a, a different technique than um, what Dr. Russo went through. This is called a Humphreys binocular balance. Um, so you pop in a plus one and two. So this is once you've done a full refraction on both eyes. So you're going to pop in that plus one, um, let's just say in this case, into the patient's left eye. Um, and then just cover their eye. There's no need to put the occluder, just save some time, cover their eye and just say, what can you read for me there? It's going to be a bit blurry. And hopefully they get to around 2040 or 612, depending on, on what you're working with. Um, if, then, if they're not reading, if you pop that plus in and they're reading maybe 2025 or 675, then you just want to keep adding 025s from here. Keep increasing the power until they see about 2040. Then you want to take your plus 025 and your minus 025 lens here. So they've got that, that plus one lens in their left eye. And you're going to say to them, so you're going to take these lenses, you're going to say, is it clear with lens one or lens two? If they say lens one, then you know that you've over minus them a little bit. And you're going to give them that 025, grab another 025 from here and repeat again. Is it better one or two? And you're going to keep doing that until they reverse, till they say they're about the same or until they want the, um, the negative. And I would go one step back if they say, oh, now I prefer the red, I would take out the last 025. Then you're going to pop in the plus one into this eye. And then you're going to take this plus one out. And the reason I want to do that is I want to maintain that fog um, if, if I can, that relaxed accommodation. I'm going to go through the same process as a clearer with one or two. This is one. This is two. If they prefer the second, then I'm going to add that minus in. If they prefer the first, then I'm going to add that plus in. So that's a nifty little trick um, with your trial frame. Okay, any questions before we move on? Okay, so we do have a question from the JCC. Why did I choose a, mi a minus 050 um, diopter sill lens? Um, the reason is because it gives you, it gives the patient something to see, if that makes sense. If it gives them a, it gives them the opportunity to see a big difference in, in the two lenses. Yeah. If I popped in an 025, I'm just not confident that the power is high enough for them to even notice any different. Uh, yeah, all the time the axis on the autorefractor is, uh, or my RET is different to my subjective. Hopefully not on my RET. Hopefully I'm really good on my RET and I'm getting that a little bit more um, accurately. But sometimes when you have a scissor reflex, it's really difficult. Um, and autorefractors are wrong all the time. In the case of strabismus, how do we uh, refract? We might have to cover that in another time. In JCC, should we use the dots or the lines? Um, we're going to go through that in a second. Do we need to binocular balance a presbyopic patient? No, you don't because they don't have any accommodation left. Okay, so we're going to spend, we're going to go a little bit over. I'm so sorry, Lawrence, but just a little, I promise. We're just going to go um, through some clinical pearls for refracting. Um, I'm not going to go over this technique, but it is outlined here. It's written out in the notes here. It's successive alternate occlusion. It's another thing that you can do for binocular balance. And it's uh, also the technique that Dr. Russo went over in her lecture. I did want to just point out, though, 
um, you add in your plus sphere lenses and then you're going to just use your hand to cover it. So you don't need to use the occluder or anything like that. You're just going to go, is it clearer with the left eye or the right eye? This is the left, this is the right. And then you're gonna add in the plus 025 accordingly. So have a look at Dr. Russo's lecture. She goes through this uh, very clearly. Have a look at the notes um, that you can download um, from the library later today. Um, she also mentions uh, in her, uh, in, Dr. Russo mentions in her, um, in her webinar, if you're going to leave one a little, a one eye a little bit clearer than the other, then leave the dominant eye clearer. And I just wanted to quickly go through that or how to find your dominant eye. So you get the patient to go like this with their, with their hands and to put the letter E or something that you have up on the chart in the middle there with both eyes open. Then you're gonna cover one eye and then you're gonna cover the other and you're gonna ask if that E moves. If the E moves, then you know that you're closing the dominant eye. So they're seeing with their non-dominant eye. So um, that's a, a great nifty way to identify dom eye dominance in free space. Steady your JCC lens. A lot of people, it's essentially that you rem um, remain on axis. So you can see in this picture here that the lines don't quite match up with the cylinder lines. So you want to make sure that you're remaining on axis, that your JCC lens matches the, the lens of your patient. So just use your finger if you want. It's okay to use your finger to steady it. So you go one, four, two, three, or four. What if I can't isolate a line um, or an O for Jackson cross cylinder? And that's, I think I would prefer if I'm gonna isolate a line, I would actually prefer to isolate the letter D, particularly in older patients. It's easier to say uh, which, I'm gonna show you two lenses and I want you to tell me which lens makes that D look more, more like a D, and which lens makes it look like an O? So this is lens one, this is lens two. And they say, oh, well, lens two, it looks like a D. Lens one, it looks like an O. So you know that lens two is the correct answer, is the answer that you're looking for. Um, I also, rather than isolate a line, I would prefer the dots, but not every chart has the dots available, which is why I went for the line in our example. Um, but I do prefer the dots. Um, I think it's easier for the patient to focus on just for sort of one thing um, rather than a line of letters and assessing a whole line of letters. So you would just ask the patient, which side of the lens makes the dots rounder and darker? This is side one, this is side two. What if my patient always thinks two is the answer? This happens all the time and I don't know why it's two. I don't know why patients love the number two. Um, so this is how um, my, my instructions go. Before I start, I say I'm going to show you two lenses and each time I want you to tell me which lens makes the line, the line of letters or the dot or the D look clearer. Then I'm gonna show them this is lens one this is lens two. If they say, can I see that again? Then I say, this is two, this is one. So I don't keep flicking back from one, two, one, two. It just saves a little bit of time. So they say, okay, I like lens two. And then you say, great. Now, when you tell me between three and four, this is three, this is four. And they say four, great. Now between five and six, this is five. This is six. So you're making it very clear that each time the lenses, the, the pair of lenses are very different. And then when you get to about five or six or seven or eight, I'll say again now, one or two. You can actually see that my instructions are getting smaller and smaller. Once I know that the patient understands the game, um, then I don't have to keep explaining myself and that saves you a little bit of time. Fan and block, what if I have this chart but I have no JCC lens? And that is a, a I love fan and block. I think fan and block is uh, very, very helpful. You can see that you have a fan there. And you can see if you have a look at the picture there, you can see this little um, dial moving around that dial with the, uh, with the triangle and the, and the blocks moves around. So you're gonna ask the patient which of the lines on the fan are clearest and darkest. 
Now, you can see the instructions are written out here. We're going to go through this relatively quickly, but I want you to have a look at the instructions. If you have any questions on this technique, if you don't understand something, jump on CyberSite on our discussion page, and I am happy to answer any questions that you have regarding this. So you're going to ask them which is clearer. They say at 90 degrees. So you move your um, arrow so it's pointing uh, perpendicular to that 90 degrees. So you're going to be, that arrow is going to be pointing to 180. And you know you're pointing it at the right direction you, because you direct the patient to the arrow now. You say, I'm going to move this around. I want you to tell me when the arrow has equally clear arms. And you're going to ask them which one of uh, those, sorry, which one of those blocks is clearer, the top set or the bottom set. If they say, uh, and the aim of the game is to move, and you can see the eye here, the aim of the game is to move both points of the astigmatism back onto the retina. And so you're going to add your minus cell um, in the direction of the um, of the blocks that are clearer. You're going to continue to do that until they say it's until they say it's equally clear. Um, you can see here when I started, I moved I moved the a circle of least confusion up, and I did that by just adding about half the astigmatism. There's a neat little table down the bottom. If you're not quite sure what their astigmatism is, um, and you're a bit unsure about your retinoscopy. Um, if you're seeing about 2040, for example, or 612, you're probably looking at a, at a astigmatism of about 150 or so. So that gives you an idea. So all of these are written out. What if I have no JCC lens, but I have this clock chart? Again, it works in a very similar way. You ask the patient, you put a plus one lens in front of the eye and you ask the patient, so this is with no astigmatism lens or cylinder lens in there. And you ask the patient, which line on the clock position is the darkest and the sharpest? Then if they say, just say in this example, they say the two o'clock line is sharpest. So you can say, okay, so you multiply two, the position that they tell you by 30, and that gives you your degrees. So then you're gonna place an, a minus 025 lens at, that, at 60 degrees in our example here. Um, and you're gonna ask them again, which line is darkest and sharpest? If they say, yeah, it's still that two o'clock, you're gonna now change that um, minus 025 diopter cell lens to a minus 050. And now you're gonna say, okay, now which line is darkest and sharpest? And you keep adding that minus 025 lens in steps until the patient says they're the same, all the lines look equal, or until they say a different set of lines look equal. So this is a nice way of finding out where astigmatism is. Can I use this to find astigmatism? Yes, you can. Um, stenoic slit is not used quite as often, but you pop it in the trial frame and you get the patient to shift this, um, the slit around in the trial frame until, um, until the uh, vision is clearest. And you wanna make sure that you add a plus or 50, you fog the eye a little bit before you do this. Um, and then when the slit is aligned, you know that that's where your minus cylinder axis is. And you can actually uh, correct both of them, the, both the minus and the, and the um, positive cell. You can um, spherically using this. So I've written out the instructions here. If you have any questions, please jump on our discussion board. Someone posted up, they're worried about vertex distance. Is that, a, is that a concern? Absolutely, if you have a high prescription, you should be worried about vertex distance. So you want your lens in the back well to make sure that it's closest to the eye. And you, have, you can see you've got a little ruler on the side there where you can actually measure what the patient's vertex distance is. So when you're prescribing their eyeglasses, you can match it. What about refracting over a pair of glasses? We've got these nifty little clips here called Bernal clips. They go over your, uh, sorry, these are just made by Bernal the trial clips. Um, they go over your glasses and then you can do your refraction as you would usually in a trial frame, um, but just popping the lenses in this well here. This is really handy for low vision patients, for patients who have really high cell or really high prescription, or if you're out 
um, and you don't have a virtometer or a lensometer um, to tell you what the glasses prescription is, you can just make a minor adjustment. And then when you get back to the clinic where you have the prescription, you can um, work out what the, what the prescription is and prescribe it for the patient. What about low vision patients? And we had this question, what do we use? Do we use the minus 025 JCC or the minus 050 JCC? And I would say you use the minus 025 or minus 050 in really any patients that are, that are young and seeing 20, 20, 40, 20, 50, if they're, if they're seeing well, then uh, obviously if they're seeing 20, 20, then an 025 is gonna be fine. The higher that visual acuity gets up, you want a bigger difference between the two flips, between the two sides. If a patient has low vision, then you're going to choose your JCC lens based on how low their vision is. So if a patient had 2200, you, what you want is you want to make sure that you have a just noticeable difference of plus or minus two. So you want to say, so you also oh, plus or minus one. So you, so a difference of two. So you want to say, is it clearer here or here? And you want to make sure the difference between those two lenses that you've shown them is two diopters because their blow, their vision is so low. They won't be able to tell the difference if you give them options that are closer together. So a good little technique, if you're seeing 2200, that's a just noticeable difference of two. So you're gonna use a plus or minus one JCC. So you can buy a plus or minus one, one JCCs and plus or minus 075. Sometimes they come in in a different set. Chart conditions, you wanna make sure that your chart is clean, that it's distinct, that it's at eye level. Also in a screening situation, if you're doing best visual acuity, if you're testing for best visual acuity, that is absolutely uh, fine. Even if maybe you're not exactly at 20 feet or five feet, whatever you had decided um, your distance to be, uh, as long as the chart doesn't move, that's okay. Um, so sometimes in a screening position, we have to just live with the conditions that we have and you put your chart up on the wall and you measure from the wall. So as long as you don't keep moving the chart or the patient's chair, then you'll be able to judge whether or not their vision is improving. A uh, logma chart is a friend for all, particularly as an Australian optometrist, I am a huge, um, I am a huge lover of the logma charts and so uh, there were two Australian doctors who uh, came up with the logma system. Um, but the logma is fantastic because you can move it if uh, you're at six meters or 20 feet, if you have that distance. So if you have that to 10 feet or three meters, then you should expect um, it, to get, it to get half as good. Um, and so you can calculate what the exact prescription, uh, what the exact visual acuity is, even if it's above or beyond um, what, what, they, what you can show them with your chart. So you can move around, you can adjust it for a screening situation. Uh, logma charts come in letters, they come in tumbling E's where the patient points which way the elephant legs are pointing or the legs of the E are pointing. Lea symbols are fantastic for children, they are by far the best visual acuity chart um, and symbols you can use for, for children. They're very well uh, researched. And you can do a land not see, oh sorry, a land not see went missing. We've got some numbers there instead. You can also do a land not see or you can do some numbers. Okay, we're nearly there. What if I'm not um, sure if the patient will be comfortable with this change in refraction? That's really handy with a trial frame that you can get them to walk around with it and with their prescription. And what about finding a near prescription for presbyopes? So everyone reads at different reading distance again, which is why it's really handy for um, you to do your uh, refraction in a trial frame because then when you give them their reading material rather than it being set at 40 centimeters in your phoropter they can hold it really wherever they want to which is fantastic so if you're like my dad and he holds his paper out here then you can prescribe for that distance um, or if you like me and you hold your, your paper up or your book up really close then you can prescribe for that distance what prescription do I start with? And this isn't really a, a, a lecture on prescribing, but those ages give you an idea um, of what kind of prescription you could start with. What you wanna do is you, you start with that um, prescription and then you wanna say, okay, I'm gonna show you um, 
I'll, I'm going to show you some other lenses. And you're going to pop in your plus O two fives from your set here and say, is it better with these lenses or better without? Whilst they're looking at that at that reading prescription. I get a lot of things of it's awkward adding like lenses over the top whilst they're reading and trying not to block them. It is awkward. And I love my flippers for this reason. I have O plus and minus O two five flippers. So when they're reading, I'll say, is it better with these lenses or better without? And then if they say better without, then I'm going to flip them to the minus and say better with these lenses or better without. And it's just a little bit easier. So it's a nice little trick there. Lastly, um, with kids, what do we do with kids? Um, you can get smaller trial frames with kids. And we had a question before, can we do um, JCC with kids? And no, you can't really. Um, you want the, the kid to be able to tell the difference between your two views. But what I am going to do is I'm going to do retinoscopy. Um, most, and that's what I'm going to mostly rely on. Um, if I want to make sure that I haven't, over minus because their accommodation is so active, but I haven't cycloed them, then um, I can do a, uh, a fogging method, but essentially with both eyes, I'm gonna put in the plus or 50 over both eyes. I'm gonna tell them it's gonna be really fuzzy. And then I'm gonna slowly decrease that until they can read the line that they were reading um, beforehand. So very similar to a fogging technique, but doing it binocularly. Okay, that's the end of our lecture. I'm so sorry we went a little bit over. I'm just going to check we've got so if we've got any questions here. Why negative cylinders only? Because I'm an optometrist and that's what optometrists work in. Sorry about that. How do you binocular balance with prisms? We're not going to go through um, that. You can binocular balance um, with prisms. We might actually cover that um, in the binocular vision lecture, but um, we'll sort of, I'll chat to Dr. Geyser about that. But we, it, that technique will be in the manual that we post up online at the end of the week. Okay, I think that that probably answers all of our questions at the moment. Thank you so much for, for bearing with me. I'm sorry I went 15 minutes over, but I hope that was really helpful. If you have any questions about any of the techniques, um, particularly once we post the manual up online, um, please contact us through CyberSite. Um, you go up on that discussion page and um, ask any questions. We love to hear from you and we want to hear from as many people as possible. Um, and, and share as many patient cases as possible. So please um, join us online. So, Great. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. No, thank you.